Art, thanks so much for taking the time. I appreciate it. My pleasure, Dimitri. Glad to be here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I want to talk a bit about business development, right? You, uh, 30 years ago, you created a business, right? And that business has obviously changed over time, but the core of it still remains what you created. Broadly speaking, and this may be tough and it's a broad question, what is the most important part of starting any kind of business? Well, number one, you need to be having a dream that you think is important. You have to have some sort of an idea that you think has to be brought forward onto the world. You obviously have to be very motivated. You know, if you're just dreaming about this, it's not going to go anywhere. The other thing that I believe you need, two things. I think you need luck. And you also need to have some savings. If you have savings in an account, you can anticipate some tough times because you've got some savings to hurt to tide you over to pay your bills. The other item, of course, is luck. In my particular case, I was lucky that Hollywood had become a factor in making martial arts popular. Through movies and television, they had done a good job at getting the public convinced that martial arts, Steven Seagal, Chuck Norris, Jean-Claude Van Damme, Bruce Lee, were superheroes. So when I came along, I had the determination. I had the idea because back in the day in the 90s, young guys would argue and debate whether or not certain martial arts were better than others. Who was the world's best fighter? Wasn't a new idea. It was an old idea. It goes back to the Olympics for a thousand years until the emperor banned it for being too violent, too pagan. But I had the idea in the 90s. And when I went to television, I knew it couldn't be on broadcast TV. I knew it wouldn't be on cable. It belonged on pay-per-view. And that was the home of boxing and wrestling. And they all told me the same thing. You can hit a man when he's down on the canvas. You can't do that in boxing. This is too violent. What did you see in the landscape out there in the world that would effectively make cage fighting, right? This is what that is, at least at its initial stages, into this global sport, something that you can market to the general public over time? Well, I came to the creation of the Ultimate Fighting Championship from a job in advertising. So I knew how to sell stuff. I had studied the martial arts, but I was not a black belt in any martial art. What I knew how to do was to sell, and I understood markets, and I knew there was a market worldwide, worldwide, of young men 18 to 34 years of age all over the world that would enjoy this type of event. Understanding that that market was out there I was confident when I wrote a plan that I could get people to join me. Now, all the experts said, oh, it's too violent, can't do this, not gonna sell, be illegal, you know? And I said, I was convinced. I said, no, no, it's gonna be huge. Now, what has happened, two things. The fighters themselves really got into it. They began to cross train. The guys who could kick and punch learned how to grapple. They learned wrestling. They learned judo. They learned jujitsu. That started to change everything. And then globalization. Today, North and South America, Europe, Africa, Asia, there are mixed martial arts clubs and gyms in Shanghai and Beijing, in Oslo, Norway. In Bangkok, Thailand, the home of Muay Thai kickboxing. It's all over the world. So I knew in 1993, this was going to be a hit. 
So I was ready to accept no. I heard no from Lou DiBella at HBO. He was the, the genius of boxing on HBO. Jay Larkin at Showtime said, you can't do this. What else do you have to sell? You got another idea? I said, no, this is it. Michael Oresco, ESPN said, we can't do this. You can't do this in boxing. I didn't care. I knew it was huge. And what has happened in the last 30 years, I was right. That makes me feel good. How important was Hoyes Gracie to the beginning of this whole thing, right? These days in sports, whether it's basketball or football or, or baseball, right? Sports leagues are really star-driven industries, right? And the UFC has kind of joined in that route. Was Hoyes Gracie the star that pushed it forward? How important was it to have somebody like him at the forefront? You know, I wanted his brother Hickson. The family champion was Hickson Gracie. And I kept saying to Horion, am I getting Hickson? But by July and August of 93, Horion said, no, 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 it's going to be Hoyce. I said, Hoyce? Hoyce was 28 years old, Dimitri, but he acted like he was 17 or 18. He had a driver's license, but he did not have a bank account or a credit card. He was the guy that swept up at the academy every night. And on Saturday, he would go into the office and he would say to Horian, I'm going to go out to the beach. Horian would open the safe and he would take three $20 bills out of the safe. He would give them to Horian. Horian would go to the beach. He'd buy lunch. He'd flirt with the girls. He'd do a little surfing. So in my opinion, Hoist was like, you know, he's the baby of the family. But Horian actually had a very smart idea. He said, putting Hoist in is brilliant. I said, why? He said, if I put Hickson in, Hickson looks like a Jaguar. He's all muscle and bone. He looks great. People could believe he could be maybe the best fighter. Hoist looks like it's like Bruce Lee, you're putting in maybe the small, Hoist weighed 175 pounds soaking wet. It was brilliant. But early on, Hoist, who was not a great interview, was not my star. Ken Shamrock and Dan Severin were my stars. Both of them were better at interviews. And Shamrock looked like Captain America. Stripped down to his red Speedos, I used to call Shamrock Hamlet in tights. Hamlet? Because I never knew which Shamrock was going to show up. Am I the greatest fighter? Or am I upset with what's going on? And voice is not there for me to fight? I'm going to quit and go home. Which is what he did in UFC 3. So they were my two stars initially. Hoist, in a way, helped sell the event. But I couldn't even get Hoist on the cover of Black Belt magazine after the first two or three UFCs. They were willing to put Henzo Gracie and Bart Dale, a shoot fighter from Florida, on the cover of Black Belt, but not Hoist. So Horia was right in one respect. It helped sell Gracie Jiu Jitsu because you could see that the grapplers did better and the ones who did best the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu athletes. You know, it's so funny. You mentioned you're an ad guy. When you watch that first event and you see a six foot five skinny kickboxer against a 400 pound sumo wrestler, whose idea was that? Because as an ads guy, right, that's something that draws eyeballs off the bat. I knew immediately that I needed to be the guy who was going to be the booker and matchmaker. And Horion, as my partner, was very cooperative. He said, I don't know anything about all those other martial arts, Penjack, Salat, Kendo, Kempo. He said, I don't care. We can beat all those guys anyway. So I became the booker and the matchmaker. And I had an interest, encyclopedic interest in the martial arts from A to Z. And I went out early on and said, what do the fans want to see? Well, my advantage was while I had studied the martial arts, I wasn't a black belt in any martial art. So I didn't have any prejudice. If I had been a karate black belt, I would have been booking the event based around putting you know, different styles of karate at the center and seeing how they could eliminate these other arts. 
I was interested in finding out for the fans who was the best. I said to myself, I bet the fans would say, how would a heavyweight boxer do against a karate black belt? So I had to recruit a boxer. I tried to get Leon Spinks, Bone Crusher Smith. Mike Tyson was in prison. I couldn't get Mike Tyson. But I also said to myself, hey, wait a minute. How would a sumo guy do in this event? One of those sumo guys at 350, 400 pounds, wouldn't he pick somebody up and throw them outside the octagon? I said, the fans are going to want to see that. So my job was to go from A to Z. Kendo, Kempo, Aikido, Penjack Salat, Sambo, Judo, Jiu-Jitsu. I didn't care. My job was to find people who said they were the best. And I went in the magazines. I put an ad in Black Belt. Put an ad in Inside Karate. I put an ad in Inside Kung Fu. And I was there to answer the phone. And I waited for people to call me. And then I began to go out with faxes to everybody from Holland to Japan. That's how I found Gerard Gordeau. I knew in Europe that the fighters who were most skilled at kicking and punching had gone over and fought in Japan and Thailand. There were two gyms in Holland, the Chakariki gym run by Tom Harrink and the Muguro gym run by Jan Plas. I called them up. I said, I got to get a great kick fighter from Holland. Well, I couldn't afford Andy Hoog, who had won K1 from Switzerland. Couldn't afford him. Couldn't afford Ernesto Hoost. But Jan Plas said to me, I got a guy who's not only tough in the ring, he's fought in Japan and Thailand, but if you're in trouble and people owe you money in Amsterdam, this is the guy you hire to collect the money, Gerard Gordeau. And I spoke to Gordeau and brought him over with no appearance fee. And when I met Gordeau, he said to me, you know, he says, I, I, I can't fight on the streets in Holland. I said, why? He said, well, I've got a 32 Mauser I keep in my back pocket. 32 Mauser pistol? He said, yeah. And he said, I have a straight razor that I put in my sock. I said, why do you need that? He said, because everybody knows what I can do with my hands. They don't want to fight me on the street. So he says, they're always armed. I got to be armed. That's the kind of guy I put into UFC 1 against Hale Turi. Yeah, True who, story. How hard was it to get investors for this kind of thing? You know, interestingly enough, I was pretty good by that point at selling. I had sold insurance. I had sold cars. I had sold investments. So I said to Horian, I'll tell you what we're going to do. Let's put out the word. He had about 250, 300 students at the Gracie Academy in Torrance. I said, let's put out the word that we're going to have an investment available here. And I wrote up a 65-page business plan. And I had financial projections for five years. So we recruited 21 investors who were students of the Gracie Academy and seven friends of mine who had money. We recruited 28 people that gave us a quarter of a million dollars. With that quarter of a million dollars, I was now able to go to HBO, Showtime, ESPN, and that's how I found Semaphore Entertainment Group. They were not as big as HBO or Showtime, but they had been doing concerts and comedy on pay-per-view. They had done Bruce Springsteen. They had done the Judd's farewell concert, Naomi and Winona Judd. They had done Andrew Dice Clay as the heavyweight champion of comedy. They had not done sports. Actually, they had done one sporting event. They had done Martina Navratilova versus Jimmy Connors. And this was 10 years after Billie Jean King versus Bobby Riggs. Nobody cared. So they had not done any kind of a fighting sport. And I went to New York and I said to them, this is going to be huge. I said, this is a franchise. I said, I don't want to do one show. I want to do shows for the next five years. I want to do five to 10 shows a year. And that's how I saw Bob Marowitz at Semaphore Entertainment. He was doing concerts and comedy. They're one shots. 
I was saying to him, let's do a franchise. And he thought, gee, the wrestling people, they've got the WWE. They're doing a show every month. This could be good. That's how I got it sold. You know, the narrative is such that when Zufa bought uh, the UFC, they worked towards regulation, right? And prior to that, regulation was so difficult to come by. What were the difficulties there? Why was it such a tough time to be regulated by all these states, athletic commissions? That's a very good question, Dimitri. And I always tell people that we did it in Colorado the first time because there was a loophole in the Colorado law that allowed bare knuckle martial arts contests. In fact, the Sabaki Challenge, which had been won by Pat Smith in January of 1993, was held at McNichols Arena, where I eventually held UFC 1 November 12th. So with that first state, we had a loophole in the law. I knew we couldn't do it in California, New York, or New Jersey, or Illinois. In fact, I got the first state after the first five, six, seven UFCs I've got in Mississippi to sanction the event. And I remember that the commissioner down there was Billy Lyons, who was a good old Southern boy. And he used to say to me, Art, I don't understand all this graveling. What's all this graveling? He said, we, we understand you know, fist fighting, we understand punching. What's with the graveling? I said, that's part of what this is all about. I said, seven or eight bouts out of 10 will go to the canvas. He said, is the public gonna watch that? I said, it's already happening. By UFC 2, we had done almost 300,000 subscribers on pay-per-view. We did 87,000 for UFC 1. This was a hit from the very beginning. I was right about the audience, Dimitri. There were a million young guys out there that were debating whether or not karate could be boxing or wrestling or kung fu. The market was there. All we had to do was say, come on and watch it. Come on, next month we're going to be on. It just kept going, kept growing. But every state became a battle. By UFC 5 in Charlotte, Center for Entertainment was paying for both a civil attorney and a criminal attorney. The police were going to my fighters and saying, if you fight Friday night, we may be able to arrest you for assault. And one of my fighters, Steve Jenham, the alternate who won UFC 3, was a police officer in Omaha, Nebraska. He came up to me and said, Art, the cops told me if I fight Friday night, they could arrest me. I could lose my badge. What should I do? So this was the kind of pressure we were under. And it got worse. All throughout 96 and 97, you had Senator McCain from Arizona calling it human cockfighting. Brian Gumbel goes on national television on ABC and says, this is the most barbaric show in the history of television. The New York Times called it that, the LA Times. So we were getting tremendous pressure. I could see the handwriting on the wall. In June of 1995, I decided to sell our half. We own half. We own 50% of the UFC. Semaphore owned the other half. Horian, I convinced Horian we're going to sell Bob Marowitz at Semaphore. And we did. Now, they kept me on as the commissioner and the booker and the matchmaker until January of 98. I knew how to do that. Nobody else did. But by late 1997, Viewer's Choice and Request, Leo Hendry over at Viewer's Choice decided to ban this. He said, I, we can't do this anymore. By early 1998, Bob Marowitz was not making the kind of money. He was losing money. So 2001, Lorenzo and Frank came along, the Fertitta brothers, Zufa, along with their friend Dana White. Lorenzo Fertitta had been on the Nevada State Athletic Commission. When I brought K-1 to the Mirage Hotel in August of 98, Lorenzo was on the commission. And for the second or the third time, he vetoed the UFC coming to Nevada. Later on, when he bought the UFC from my ex-partner, Bob Marowitz, he brought in Mark Ratner, who had been the executive director of the Nevada State Athletic Commission as his vice president of operations for Zufa, one of the smartest things he ever did. 
brilliant. You know, you've been involved not only in MMA, in other combat sports. There was an event over the weekend, Haney Lomachenko, a boxing fight, and the judging was criticized. There was controversy over the decision. Is there anything that could be done with these commissions as it relates to improving judging, replacing it in some way? Is there any mechanism that could be put in place that you see possible? You know, Dimitri, that's a very crucial question and point you're making. That was critical in the old days when I was a young man of boxing decisions. Quite frankly, I am not sure what if there is a mechanism that we could get to have to standardize the, the level of judging in 50 states and nine provinces in Canada, for example. It's very difficult. Partly the problem is local politics. Every state, every province wants to be able to determine what they do in that area, in that municipality, in that venue, under that jurisdiction. So that's always been the difficulty. When I was a young man, there was talk about eventually appointing a national czar for boxing at the federal level in the United States of America. It never happened. There's never been enough support for it in Congress. And quite frankly, every state, whether it's New Jersey, New York, you know, Idaho, Arizona, Nevada, everybody says that we're going to do it our way. Remember, that was the loophole that I found in Colorado in 93. They had no rules against bare knuckle. Other states like, you know, Nevada and New York and New Jersey, that was illegal. So what you're talking about is part of the problem of local politics and whether or not you could get a consensus the only way that would happen, quite frankly, is in the event of a tragic death in a combat sport. And there was enough media support among the traditional stations and among social media today. That possibly would put enough pressure at the congressional level in the USA and perhaps in Canada. Other than that, I think it's a very difficult, if not impossible, task. There were talks of this, and those talks have kind of died down about unionization, unionizing fighters. Is it possible in an individual sport, unlike obviously what you have in the NBA or the NFL? That's exactly the key point and the problem. You know, when, when you've got team sports, whether it's basketball, baseball, football, hockey, lacrosse, you're organizing a team. The individual problem with uh, tennis athletes, golf athletes, and fighters is that they're individuals. <laughs> and, and really they're there's not enough momentum. Quite frankly, that's been the difficulty in, in, the, in the gentleman's club business with strippers. The problem with strippers is that they're individuals. It's not a team sport. It's not a team event. So they've never been able to organize you know, strippers in, in strip clubs or in North America. I've heard talk about it, but it's never happened. There's the difficulty. Do you see in the future as the years pass that this will become the biggest sport in the world. It seems to me that like soccer, for example, right? Uh, countries that deal in poverty, uh, technically or typically rather, have these tendencies to explode on a worldwide level, right? Soccer is a sport that is obvious in that regard because you don't need much to play soccer, right? There are limited resources, limited equipment. Fighting seems to be up that alley. Is that something that you see? I think that increasingly we're going to see the globalization of MMA, if only because of what you just said. Number one, it's not a team sport, so the 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 costs associated with staging and uh, funding a team sport are not there. On the other hand, when you look historically at the popularity of pancreation for more than a thousand years in the Greek Olympics, I understand from historians it was second only to horse racing as a sport way back in 668 BC to 494 AD. So potentially with social media, and now when we see that MMA is in Shanghai and Beijing, I have a feeling that somewhere, and I won't be around to see it, but somewhere in the next 10, 20, 25 years, I think we're gonna see MMA become even bigger. And I think we're gonna see it more globalized. And I think potentially, eventually the recognition of who is, from a nationalistic standpoint, who's the world's greatest fighter? Is he a European? Is he an African? Is he, is he a North American? Is he from South America? I think that that is going to fuel 
the globalization. My good friend Gary Goodrich is in Nairobi doing the African Fighting Championship with a bunch of people down there. And now there's one in South Africa. And as I say, the Middle East, South America, China. I have a funny feeling 25 years from today, it'll become even bigger, just for the reasons you suggested. I want to wrap up two lighter notes. Uh, the first is your Hall of Fame induction several years ago. How'd that feel? What was that experience like? Well, I got to tell you, uh, I give credit a lot to a lot of people, including John McCarthy, uh, my late friend Nathan Hendrickson, who started a great media campaign. You know, our Davey Hall of Fame, you know, hashtag. And that was great. And, uh, you know, uh, Anthony Evans, Ant Evans over at the UFC was a big fan of mine. And I think he was the guy that went in and told Lorenzo Frank and Dana, you know, we've got to have our Davey in the UFC. And you have to remember, which had been published in 2013. So it was really a great thing for me to be into the Hall of Fame in 2018. And I'm so glad when I had an opportunity to give that speech and where I credited Lorenzo Frank and Dana. I said they had the brains, the money, and the balls. And they took a great time. If they didn't do what they did, I wouldn't be here tonight. I'm glad to be able to say that. And quite frankly, the book continues to sell well. And then two years ago, Amazon Studios optioned it as a movie. And they've had three writers, and they hired a director. And they just plan on making a movie based on this book. Now, I read a rumor online, and I don't know if this is true, you'll tell me, that you were roommates or friends with Donald Trump in high school or some other academic institution. Is that true? And if so, does any of this surprise you dating back to 2016 up until now? No, it doesn't. I actually, I was 15 years old and Donald Trump was 16 and we were roommates at New York Military Academy. I mentioned it on page 36 of the book. And we were roommates from September of 1962 through January of 1963. Well, I was kind of a nerd. Trump was a pretty good athlete. He was a, not a real good football player, but he was an excellent basketball, baseball player. And the following year, he became a captain at the, at the New York Military Academy and captain of the baseball team. But we spent about four months as roommates in a two-man room in 1962 and 1963. Your life is a collection of interesting stories, and that's a life well lived, my friend. Uh, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Dimitri, it's been a pleasure, and my, my best regards to all the students at John Jay, a great school of criminology in, the, in the New York, and to you as a professor there. My pleasure.